England and the subsequent British Empire are for many the very picture of monarchy, but that wasn't always the case, and there was a point at which England nearly went down a very different path. The English civil wars that spanned from 1642 to 1651 were a mass struggle between the forces of royalism and republicanism that gripped the British Isles, and despite what you might think given the rest of Britain's history, the republican parliamentarians actually won the war. England was brought under republican control, the king was executed, and Scotland and Ireland were pacified, united into the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Now, of course, the new republic would not last, and Commonwealth leadership seeing the writing on the wall negotiated with the executed king's heir for his return to the throne. But what if that changed? What if in an alternate timeline, England and Britain as a whole remained a republic? Hello audience, Mr. Z here with another alternate history video for you. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We have videos like this every single week, so stay tuned. The English Civil War was motivated foremost by political and religious factors, but there were also underlying ethnic factors as well. Coming at the tail end of the European Thirty Years' War and the wider Reformation, faith within the British Isles was experiencing a major reorientation. By this point, England had thoroughly transitioned from Catholicism to Anglicanism, though the divide still existed between the High Church and Low Church, the former of which many recognized as too Catholic in character for its rituals and strict hierarchy, the latter of which was regarded by those in the High Church as too liberal and decentralized. In their adoption of reform, the Scots would follow shortly behind the English, but unlike the English whose Anglican practice still held close to the Catholic tradition and even briefly sought to revert back to Catholicism under Queen Mary, the Scots took to adopting a Presbyterian church structure as opposed to the English and Catholic Episcopal structures. What that meant was that the Scots elected elders to lead the church from each of their congregations instead of having bishops appointed by the king in Anglicanism or the Pope in Catholicism. This effectively put greater power of the church in the hands of the people instead of in the hands of an established elite. Many Welsh, though integrated into England and generally in line with Anglican practice, took more quickly to the Calvinist teachings of which the Scots Presbyterianism was derived. Wales later becoming a hotbed for Methodism much later down the line alongside their fellow Britannic Celts in Cornwall and Devon. Of the British Isles, only Ireland endured as a Catholic stalwart both through its native Celtic population and the mixed Celtic-Norman population along the eastern coast. They did, however, face continued pressure from England to convert and suppress Catholicism within the island. It would only be through direct colonization via the plantation of Ulster that Protestantism made significant inroads into the north and along the eastern coast. Among the more radical low church factions were the Congregationalist Puritans, primarily concentrated in East Anglia, situated in the southeast of England. Ethnically, this whole region bears a distinct Anglo-Norman background, with a significant Anglo-Scandinavian population extending northward as a remnant of the old Dane law. The Puritans strongly opposed Catholicism and what they perceived as its lingering presence in Anglicanism. They sought to purify the church by stripping away the hierarchy and ritual to instead create a pious society of individuals and autonomous congregations based purely on adherence to scripture, not the authority of a church or individual. Puritanism was, however, fairly broad in its positions, most moderates calling merely for a more representative Scottish-style Presbyterian system in place of the Episcopal system within the church, while the most radicals saw total separation from the Church of England and the adoption of decentralized congregationalism. These ethno-religious divides are worth mentioning as they are fundamental to the various factions of the English Civil War, reflecting the class and culture divide as well as the political ambitions of each. The Scots and Britannic Celts largely supported a constitutional monarchy, the Irish favored a monarchy of any kind, the Anglo-Normans and Anglo-Scandinavians sought republicanism or parliamentary dominance, and the remaining largely Anglo-Britannic population existed somewhere in between. Say, did you know that in ancient Egypt items like olive oil, ostrich eggs, dough, and essential oils made from herbs and plants were used to address skin concerns of all types? That's what the sponsor of today's video told us, Tej Hanley. If you had asked me two weeks ago about skincare, I would have said I use soap and water. But just last week, Tiege Hanley paid me to see the error of my ways. Jokes aside, gentlemen, I had the pleasure of trying out Tiege Hanley's skincare system, and you know, I think the results speak for themselves. This time of year, with the weather getting colder and harsher on your skin, it's important to have something that'll keep it hydrated, healthy, and looking great for all those important first impressions. Tiege Hanley has three levels of product based on what you're looking for. That's the essential routine, the advanced routine, and the anti-aging routine. Why not start simple? The essential routine or first level includes a daily face wash to get rid of dirt and grime on your skin, a two times per week exfoliating scrub, an AM moisturizer with SPF 20 to protect your skin from the sun, and a PM moisturizer to help your skin stay hydrated throughout the night. Every box comes with an instruction card that'll explain how to use each product, in what quantity, and in what order. I got to try out all three and for the last week, gentlemen, let me tell you, I got to do the Patrick Bateman morning routine, that's a selling point all on its own. 
And it's not just me saying this, this is a brand with over 5,000 five-star reviews. That's at least 25,000 stars. When you sign up with Tish Hanley, you're getting at least 20% off the retail price, the ability to customize your box, exclusive monthly deals, the ability to pause or cancel at any time, and free shipping across the U.S. But it gets better. Gentlemen, when you sign up using the link below, you're going to get 30% off your first box and a free gift. Don't miss out. <sighs> Alright folks, now, back to the video. Now in 1625, when Charles I took the throne, the Isles were still divided. Wales and England had been united for centuries by that point, but the Welsh continued to maintain a sense of otherness to the rest of England. Ireland stood as an essential client state of England, with the English king also serving as the King of Ireland, but the island recognized, especially following the Reformation, that it was not like Great Britain, and especially not like England itself, who regarded the Irish as lesser subjects. The Scots for the longest time had viewed themselves as rivalrous with England, and although the two had shared more culturally than the English and the Irish, there wasn't necessarily a sense of kinship between the Scots and English that would incentivize them to overtly seek closer bonds. The ascension of Charles' father James as the first member of the Stuart dynasty had brought about a personal union between Scotland and England, as James had been King of Scotland prior to the death of his cousin Elizabeth I, who died childless. This was not yet a political union, mind you, and both Scotland and England maintained independent churches and parliaments. James ruled with order and general stability, especially given the yet to have calmed religious divides across his dominion. Behind it all, James attempted to bring his personal union into something greater, a single united kingdom with a shared parliament, a shared church, and a monarch who ruled absolutely. This was, of course, met with difficulty and resistance, but James was tactful enough to maneuver the critiques and concerns of his subjects and of Parliament. The same could not be said of James' son, however. For while King James had set unity in motion, he could not undo rising anti-Catholic sentiment, especially following the gunpowder plot, which aimed at assassinating the royal family and all of Parliament. James wasn't able to complete his mission of bringing Scotland in line with the Anglican practice before his death, and the difficult task fell to Charles, who, unlike his father, did not have a strong history with Scotland to work off of, nor his father's ability to strategically compromise and negotiate. It seemed that Charles inherited his father's firm belief in absolutism with none of the political tact, this infamously costing him his life when Parliament ultimately found he could not be trusted to negotiate honestly. What hindered Charles further in his abilities to negotiate were suspicions that he himself was a crypto-Catholic, or at the very least sympathetic to Catholicism, something not at all helped by his marriage to the Catholic Henrietta Maria of France. In addition to the unfinished work of mending religious divides, Charles was left saddled with a massive deficit. He'd struggled to pursue Parliament to provide him the funds he needed for wars, and frustrated by this, ultimately dissolved Parliament and began an 11-year period of personal rule causing much outrage among the more puritanical parliamentarians, who began to view Charles as a crypto-Catholic tyrant. During this period of personal rule, Charles took to raising funds by alternative but unpopular means, something which may have been excused by his subjects had he produced more positive results in his wars against Spain and France, both of which further tarnished his reputation and left many questioning his ability to lead. These sentiments would finally come to a head in 1639 when, following Charles' efforts to bring the Scots in line with the Anglican Church, war broke out between England and Scotland, a war Charles would perform poorly in, forcing him to call Parliament back into session in hopes of reversing his losses. The Parliamentarians would agree to fund a campaign into Scotland, but only if Charles was willing to make concessions to them, which he outright refused, turning to Ireland instead where he managed to raise a small army. To Parliament, the image of Charles raising a Catholic army to enforce new religious standards upon Scotland was incriminating. Talks began of both Scotland and England invading Ireland independent of the king, which understandably worried the Irish. In 1641, the Irish rose up, capturing English forts along the coast, but reaffirming their loyalty to the king, hoping that with the Scottish Rebellion and Parliament uncooperative, Charles would finally have just cause to establish toleration of Catholicism along Anglicanism. Reaction to the rebellion, however, was far from positive for all spectators, as the Irish grew increasingly violent and word of civilians being harmed reached back to the mainland. Charles, Parliament, and Scotland now sought to suppress the rebellion, but neither faction quite trusted the other, and as such, Parliament put forward a motion for the raising of an army, but attached with it a list of complaints and proposed solutions, including to place the army under the direct command of Parliament and not the King. Charles refused, but Parliament, frustrated with the King's failures and lack of cooperation, approved the measure regardless. In response, Charles sought to arrest a select few members of Parliament he identified as radicals, but once again, he failed with the action coming to be perceived as a grave overstepping of authority and a confirmation that Charles was the tyrant Parliament had made him out to be. Charles fled London for Oxford, lines were drawn, and the English Civil War had begun.
The Anglo-Norman, Anglo-Scandinavian South and Eastern Coastal Counties threw their lot in with the Parliamentarians, while the Celtic Britonic West, Anglo-Pictish North and Mixed Interior stood by the King. In Scotland, the old Gaelic population of the Highlands and the Pictish descendant population concentrated in Aberdeenshire remained hotbeds of royalist support, while the more mixed Celtic Scandinavian and Celtic Germanic populations along the Middle Interior and Lowlands supported the Covenanters who, although wishing to reduce monarchical influence, still favored Charles as ruler, leaving Scotland to remain neutral during the early days of the English Civil War. Despite previous failures, royalist forces actually saw noteworthy victories early on, but these successes would see reversals in late 1643 and utterly collapse with two major changes shortly then after. The first of these changes came with the alignment of the Scots with Parliament in exchange for an ambiguous adoption of Presbyterianism in England. The second change was the successful military leadership of radical Welsh Puritan Oliver Cromwell, who would later aid in the establishment of the New Model Army. The New Model Army was created as a more uniform, organized standing army as opposed to the militia structure of the Royalist Army. Many within the ranks of the New Army were also Puritan radicals, and with Cromwell at their head, foreshadowed that while Parliament called for a moderate system, it was the radicals who held real power if and when they were willing to use it. In 1646, Charles was defeated but had one last trick up his sleeve. He had surrendered himself not to England but to the Scots, with whom he plotted a royalist insurrection in exchange for suppressing the Puritans, and enforcing the Scottish practice in England for a three-year trial period. The Scots, fearing the Puritans would not fully uphold their end of the bargain and simply end up dominating religion and policy themselves, accepted Charles' agreement, but were swiftly defeated in a matter of months. For Charles' deception and the continued threat many parliamentarians felt he posed, he was ultimately executed, with Cromwell purging several moderate members of parliament who opposed the execution. Charles' execution had been a radical measure which the anti-hierarchical Puritans were more willing to accept, but for the Scots who simply wanted to preserve the religious tradition which included the king, this was much too far, and so took a stance against parliament, joining what remained of the royalist movement. The Irish, seeing that nothing stood between them and unspeakable persecution at the hands of the highly anti-Catholic and anti-Irish Puritans, threw their lot in with the remnant royalists and Scots, beginning the third phase of the English Civil War. In 1649, Cromwell would arrive in Ireland and inflict significant defeats upon the Irish before turning his attention to Scotland one year later, leaving the remaining conquest of Ireland in the hands of his generals. In Scotland, Cromwell would rapidly conquer the lowlands and begin pressing northward, Charles' son, who had been crowned King of Scotland, would attempt one last invasion of England, but would be defeated and was forced to flee. With no one left to challenge him, and although power technically rested with Parliament, Cromwell soon became the essential military dictator of the New Republic. Cromwell was, however, a hesitant leader. He had a vision of a pious, churchless, equal society, but did not wish to bring this about through the rule of an individual, which he felt would be little different from that of the old monarchy. Rather, he wanted the people to bring this about through the power of a unicameral parliament, but time and time again he would be disappointed. Factionalism remained an issue within England, even with the suppression of royalist and Catholic influence. Many moderates wanted a Scottish-style Presbyterian system instead of a purely congregationalist model, and some even suggested restoring the king as a figurehead. A myriad of policies were passed by different factions, which ultimately failed to fully achieve any of their desired visions and only upset one another. Cromwell would dissolve Parliament twice before establishing what became known as the Protectorate, assuming the title of Lord Protector in an essential lifelong presidential role, but still he deferred to Parliament without success. Finally growing disillusioned with Parliament's inability to create a stable polity, he would initiate a period of direct military rule, placing the Republic under the control of his more radically puritanical army, which, though it brought stability, was widely unpopular and still dependent upon Parliament for funding. One last reorganization took place in an attempt to bring order to the Commonwealth through more conventional means. A new constitution was enacted which strengthened the role of Parliament, restored the abolished House of Lords, reduced the size of the military to bring it back into line, and allowed the Lord Protector to appoint his successor, some having hoped to make the position hereditary and overtly monarchical, but Cromwell refused this point. This final constitution had essentially rebuilt the institutions of the old order, but placed them under more definitively parliamentary and Presbyterian control. Cromwell's role was now that of a limited monarch in about all but name, and in so far succession. Ironically, however, when Cromwell did pass away, power would fall to his inexperienced son Richard. With neither parliament nor the military behind him, Richard fell from power, the commonwealth began to fracture, and the monarchy was ultimately restored under Charles II. But this time, things are different. Multiple factors were operating against Cromwell and the Republic. 
In truth, many of the radicals had overestimated the desires for reform among the population and were left pushing through generally unpopular policy, which often failed to please more than just one faction. There was also an overemphasis placed upon the need for public consensus and satisfaction when the reality was that more than anything the Commonwealth needed order, even if through unpopular means. England's history has demonstrated a similar need to compromise on short-term wants for long-term needs, and given the diverse nature of the Isles, there would always be a fair deal of dissent from the public regardless of any policy. Cromwell was in a strong position to enforce Puritanism across England, keep Scotland in line, and subjugate Ireland, but refused to step too far outside what he viewed as the democratic consensus reflected by Parliament. At the same time, he appeared unable to make pragmatic and strategic compromises, which could have brought Parliament closer to his way of thinking without the need of military force, and this resulted in Cromwell gradually conceding more and more power, but to a Parliament which he himself thought was too reminiscent of the pre-war establishment. Parliament and the army could not quite see eye to eye, and the need for a competent leader who could command and mediate with both was essential. But increasingly, Oliver Cromwell played less the leader and more of a mediator at a time when the divided Commonwealth needed clear leadership to take it in a single direction. We also cannot take for granted that these divides did not simply vanish once Charles II took the throne either. Yes, there was a long period of royalist resurgence in Parliament, but just as had occurred with his father, relations between the king and Parliament broke down, sessions were dissolved, politicians sought to act independently of the king, suspicions began to arise of Charles' Catholic sympathies, disagreements arose over foreign policy and allocation of money, and many feared the rise of absolutism. The Stuart dynasty wouldn't last much longer, famously being deposed in the Glorious Revolution by the Dutch William of Orange, who would be succeeded by Queen Anne, and later the subsequent Hanoverian dynasty. What this means is that not all blame can be placed at the feet of Cromwell and the parliamentarians. England and the Greater British Isles were experiencing growing pains, changes that would have been an obstacle for any faction in power that sought to maintain central authority and promote unity of the ethnically and religiously diverse Isles. What is clear, however, is that England itself was moving in a parliamentarian direction. The English, after years of eternal debate, had outgrown Catholicism and were becoming a distinctly Protestant nation, one which increasingly favored democratization and republicanism to absolutism. That alone might have been easier to manage, but when paired with the need to keep the Scots on the same page and assimilate the Irish, this building of a united British nation becomes all the more difficult, especially without the right leadership or governing structure. So what can be done to ensure the Republic lasts and doesn't just fizzle out? Let's take the scenario from the negotiation of the Second Constitution. Just as in our timeline, Oliver Cromwell refuses to make his position that of a monarch, but in this alternate timeline, the position of Lord Protector is altered. Rather than merely see appointment by the previous incumbent, the Lord Protector would be nominated by the Upper House of Parliament and elected by the House of Commons. Candidates would need to possess both political and military experience, given the need to mediate between both the Army and Parliament as Commander-in-Chief and Head of State. The position would still be served for life, but the Lord Protector could be impeached by a majority vote in both chambers. These conditions would serve as a check against devolution into dictatorship, but would also be a concession for additional modifications to Parliament. In order to prevent a devolution of the Republic into monarchy or anarchy, Parliament would bar Royalists and Catholics from membership and limit Scottish representation for a duration of time until the Commonwealth was thoroughly stabilized. The Anglican Church would be reorganized under a Presbyterian structure, but attendance would no longer be enforced, beginning a partial separation of church and state, which would allow Congregationalism to grow in prominence. The new model army would be reduced in size, but remain a permanent standing army receiving annual funding from Parliament, and though directly under the command of the Lord Protector, could not initiate war without parliamentary approval. As a consequence of this constitution, Cromwell would be unable to appoint his son Richard, who lacked both military and political experience, save for a brief stint in his father's Parliament. This, of course, is all for the better, as Richard proved incapable of governing, and the Commonwealth was in need of stability. While there were other options for Cromwell to choose from, he likely would still prefer a relative if they met the qualifications, and fortunately for him, his younger son Henry Cromwell fit the bill. Henry Cromwell was both a colonel in the New Model Army, a major general of forces in Ireland, and eventually its governor, a rather effective and popular one at that. Why Richard was chosen over Henry in our timeline is unclear, though it's perfectly possible Oliver Cromwell felt it appropriate that his eldest son should succeed him, or even that he'd prefer a Lord Protector who would defer to Parliament rather than dominate it. Whatever the case, in this timeline, Henry Cromwell is promoted by Oliver as his preferred successor, and thanks to both his popularity experience and the support of his father, Parliament nominates and elects Henry to the position with even more support than Richard had in our timeline leaving him to take power upon Oliver's death in 1658, just one year following the ratification of the new constitution. 
As Lord Protector of the Commonwealth, the responsibilities Henry once held in Ireland would be far greater, but so too would be his powers. Henry was far less ideological and more pragmatic than his father, as well as more cautious when it came to political threats, preemptively dismissing officers and politicians likely to stir up trouble or stall necessary progress. Movements which sought to exploit their power, or which might constitute an opposing force such as the Anabaptists in Ireland, or the Levellers in England, would be effectively suppressed. Having faced much pushback from London which hampered his governing in Ireland, he would likely take it upon himself to legally purge or remove from influence any of these same figures or other individuals in government and military to secure his authority, and prevent politically motivated inadequacies of government, of which he noted many during his time in Ireland. Resolving economic matters, especially in relation to funding the military and ensuring the mechanisms of government were in working order, would be major priorities for the new parliament. And with outside factions largely sidelined, the Cromwellian majority in parliament would finally be able to push through policies with overwhelming majorities, which, although regularly considered unpopular in various parts of the commonwealth, would gradually begin to restore normalcy. With the more radical southeastern Puritans dominating parliament, royalists and Catholics would likely face increased socio-political pressure. This, paired with the fact that the majority of royalist cavalier parliaments formed under Charles II never occur, has dramatic implications for the ethnic, religious, and economic demographics of the British Isles and its colonies. In our world, the North American colonies prove reflective of various factions within the Isles. New England was dominantly Puritan and Parliamentarian. Virginia was dominantly Royalist and Anglican, though it began to adopt more Presbyterian and even Congregationalist characteristics to meet the demands of serving widespread settler populations rather than condensed cities or towns. And Maryland was a unique case in that it was devised as a Catholic colony, or rather a religiously tolerant colony, named so after the late Charles I's Catholic wife, Henrietta Maria. Now Maryland wasn't exclusively Catholic, but rather was meant to be majority Catholic, though still tolerant and welcoming to other Trinitarian Christians. While run-of-the-mill Anglicans may have been more tolerant of Catholicism, a number of Puritans and other dissident Protestants had also began settling within the colony at a rate which was quickly changing the demographic balance. The class disparity did not help the situation either, with a majority of Catholics having been aristocrats, while the majority of Protestants were common folk and laborers, foreshadowing the eventual overwhelming of the elite Catholic population in the colony by the majority Protestant population. The Puritans would seize political control of Maryland some years following the end of the Civil War, and while power would shift back to the Catholics for a time, the demographics of Maryland would ultimately bring that to an end. Likewise, in Virginia, where the population had seen an influx of royalist refugees, a Puritan governor was placed in charge of the colony, albeit one who was more favorable to the local population and did little to change the colony's character. In this timeline, the symbolism of these colonies as havens for prosecuted populations of the Commonwealth may prove enticing enough to eventually drive greater migration to them, with Ireland being the most likely candidate. With the Cromwellian settlement of Ireland, the majority of the Irish population was displaced and left with only this fragment of the island here. While in our timeline the penalties of the 1652 Act of Settlement were undone by Charles II, that would not be the case this time around and the Irish would very likely continue to face deportation to the Caribbean as servants, execution on the grounds of faith, and more. If the Irish were to migrate to Maryland en masse in search of better living conditions, this could very well supplant the Protestant majority there and keep the Catholic elite in power indefinitely. While many would likely be too poor to make this voyage on their own, it wouldn't be hard to imagine a number of Catholic patrons either in Maryland or Ireland funding voyages in exchange for indentured service. Virginia with its relative autonomy under the new Commonwealth governors but remaining royalist character could prove an attractive home for many Welsh, Cornish, and Anglo citizens who lacked faith in the long-term success of the Republic or just outright disagreed with its direction. Many Scots and Scots-Irish had migrated to the American colonies for much less, and given the increased restrictions placed upon the Scots in this timeline, their emigration could be expected to rise as well. Overall, the basis for migration being to escape persecution and find better living conditions would alter the demographics of the migrants, incentivizing a greater deal of families to make the journey instead of just prospective young men seeking financial opportunity. This would ultimately contribute to the exponential growth of the migrant descendant population over the next few decades. Ethnically, the southern colonies would become significantly more Celtic, and an amalgamation of Celtic groups as well, instead of the predominantly Scotch-Irish population of our timeline. This is not even mentioning the fact that Maryland may persist as a dominantly Catholic colony, changing the wider intercolonial dynamic. This would contrast sharply with the colonies of New England, who would be far more reminiscent of this timeline's Puritan England, and be a more model colony shaped in its own image, albeit one whose growth may begin to slow or even decline, with some Puritans returning to the now more welcoming Commonwealth. 
Without the restoration of Charles, the Act of Uniformity, Conventicle Act, and Five Mile Act, which all contributed to what was known as the Great Ejection of the Puritans from the Anglican Church and their subsequent suppression, don't occur either. The England of our timeline, although partially shaped by the Puritans, was ultimately still defined by Episcopal-style Anglicanism, but this time around, Puritanism is far more prominent, and as a result, the culture of England may well end up more reminiscent of the culture of New England as we knew it. Although given Henry Cromwell's more pragmatic positions, we might look to a more moderately Puritan colony like Connecticut than the more radically Puritan theocracy of Massachusetts. The survival of the Commonwealth and Henry's leadership might just prove sufficient enough to build a stronger relationship with the Protestant Dutch in this timeline. In our timeline, rivalry over trade and naval dominance had led Oliver Cromwell into war with the Dutch, and Charles II would be made to quarrel with them for similar reasons. Now while it is possible the subsequent Anglo-Dutch wars might be averted, the struggle for naval and trade supremacy would likely be too great to overcome, but the Commonwealth would still come out on top. If the wars were averted, the Dutch could have retained control over their North American colony of New Netherland, though for how long and in what capacity would still be in question, as the Dutch had neglected to provide the colony sufficient security and could not populate it enough to allow it to easily defend its borders. Whether or not the wars occurred, New Netherland would almost certainly fall under Commonwealth control given their continued prominence on the colonial and naval scene. New Netherland's frontier territories would be divided up by their more densely populated neighbors, while the core of the colony would retain relative autonomy. The Commonwealth was not known to be very attentive to its colonies, much preferring to leave them largely to their own devices and focus domestically instead. This was seen in Parliament's response to Royalist Virginia and Catholic Maryland during their periods of unrest, simply appointing or removing leadership when necessary. The Commonwealth experiencing a similar naval rivalry with the Catholic power of Spain would still throw its support behind Portugal in the Restoration War just as in our timeline, however there would be no marriage between the Portuguese Catherine of Braganza and Britain's head of state to cement the alliance as had occurred with Charles in our timeline. Why this is consequential is that Catherine brought with her colonial possessions, including Bombay and India, which would be fostered into a trade hub and prove significant to the East India Company's future expansion across the subcontinent. Cromwell himself was interested in acquiring the territory for the Commonwealth, and though it is possible for it to be purchased or acquired by other means in this timeline, we'll just assume that's not the case. While Monmouth's rebellion and the Glorious Revolution never occur in this timeline, it's reasonable to assume that some parallel rebellions or attempted coups would occur, perhaps in Scotland or the colonies, or even taking the form of a military uprising and the emergence of a warlord period in Britain akin to the old Heptarchy. French support would almost certainly be behind any such rebellions with the intent of destabilizing the Commonwealth and eliminating them both as a competitor and as an ideological threat. If we assume the Cromwellians had managed to stabilize the Commonwealth prior to Henry's death in 1674 and suppress domestic threats within England, pacifying Scotland or crushing a minor rebellion wouldn't be difficult. And it can be assumed that Henry would have been sensible enough to remove military officers he suspected of disloyalty and build his support among the ranks as his father did, appointing a trustworthy successor, though ideally another Cromwell with military experience. Suppressing a colonial uprising may prove more difficult, as we could expect the southern population to have grown substantially from the influx of anti-parliamentarian settlers, to the point that Puritans would be far outnumbered. This could be what we see unfold with the outbreak of the Nine Years' War or the War of Spanish Succession, with the French staging much grander plays of their Jacobite and Indian wars with the instigated support of the southern colonies. Maryland would likely flip in support of Catholic France immediately, feeling increasingly uneasy with the growing Puritan population in New York and hoping to be brought under more sympathetic rule. The southern colonies would be more divided, as were Scotland, England, and Wales in the Jacobite risings of our timeline leaving them to potentially side fully with France or face an internal struggle for dominance between rebels and Commonwealth loyalists. The Commonwealth would have almost certainly heightened the southern colony's sense of independence given its hands-off approach to colonial rule, meaning that whether it be during this or a future conflict, these colonies would inevitably desire full independence, already developing ambitions of expanding further westward. The support of the southern colonies would be essential to Maryland's survival in the long term, as France historically had not performed well in this theater of conflict leaving it with little ability to negotiate if Catholic Maryland was facing enemies on two fronts. A world in which the southern colonies side with France and Maryland would significantly impact global imperial relations. As we mentioned, the French had not been particularly effective at growing and defending their overseas possessions, at least in comparison to Britain. This meant that French gains against Britain or its allies on continental Europe were often forfeited to reclaim French colonies, but with a highly populated colonial ally, France finally has an overseas edge on the Commonwealth. If the French fostered the relationship with the South, they, in addition to Maryland, who would have automatically become a French ally, could check the expansion of Britain's empire and relegate them to a still wealthy trade power, though no longer the imperial giant they would have become in our world. 
France instead gradually taking on that role. Maintaining a firmer grasp over India which was lost in the subsequent Seven Years' War, and with the agricultural resources of the South to bolster France's own shrinking supply, this potentially allows it to stave off its own revolution. On the French Revolution, the success of the Commonwealth and the endurance of the Republic would likely contribute to increased anti-Republican views within France and possibly keep radicals out of positions of influence. Though that being said, it's equally possible the Commonwealth increases the influence of Republicanism within France, supporting and provoking anti-royal ideas and actions, leaving the two countries locked in a lingering ideological rivalry. Once again, folks, big thanks to Tish Hanley for sponsoring today's video. Click the link below to get 30% off your first box and a free gift.